What up, what up, what up? Welcome back to Pinoy News. So, I stood here and I was reading an article last night uh, from, I think it was the Times or something like that, or the Economist, where they were sitting here going, oh, China's trying to bring back the you know, original social, uh, socialist idea and the whole worldview of Mao Zedong. And I'm just standing here going like, man, listen, like these people have, they've lost the plot, right? I wanted to sit here and actually bring you the guy who the Chinese have based their model off of. And this guy here was actually far more influ influential. His name's uh, Frederick List. And he was so influential in the 20th century. And people have never actually heard of him. But if you've heard of, you know, I mean, John Maynard Keynes, then you know this guy because this is a guy who John Maynard Keynes took a lot of his ideology from and studied very heavily. This guy was extremely influential in his time. Uh, he actually was, uh, he was uh, an economist who was sent out as a delegate to places like France and England and Germany under President Andrew Jackson in the 1820s. That's a crazy thing to understand, right? I mean, because we're talking like, you know, like we're talking a guy who actually sat here and formed economic policy as an, um, all right, he was born in Germany, came to America, was sent as a delegate from America to Germany, and helped Germany set up the rail that allowed them to industrialize and turn into the Third Reich, right? So that's a crazy, you know what I mean, CV as far as stuff's really concerned. So I wanted to bring him to you and go, hey, look, let me sit here and explain to you, or sit here and bring you his writings, and let, let me, you know, let, let's see what you think. All right. So this is from, this is from Frederick List's, uh, the national system of political economy. People call him a mercantilist, but it's not true, right? He is not a mercantilist. And it's, it's based on protectionism, but it's not, Right. As all good things are, like he took some of the things from mercantilist thought of uh, thoughts and sat here and and I'm going to skip over like the preface and all these type of things. And I'm going to go straight to like the book itself. Right. <laughs> let, let, let's get into it. All right. First book, The History, Chapter One, The Italians. At the revival of civilization in Europe, no country was in so favorable position, uh, favorable a position as Italy in respect to commerce and industry. Barbarism had not been able to eradicate the culture and civilization of ancient Rome. A genial climate and fertile, fertile soil, notwithstanding an unskillful system of cultivation, yielded abundant nourishment for a numerous population. The most necessary arts and industries remained in as little destroyed as the municipal institutions of ancient Rome. Prosperous coast fisheries served everywhere as nurseries for seamen, and navigation along Italy's extensive sea coast abundantly compensated her lack of internal means of transport. Her proximity to Greece, Asia Minor, and Egypt, and her maritime intercourse with them secured for Italy special advantages <clears throat> in the trade with the, with the East, which had previously thought not extensively been carried on through Russia with the countries of the North. By means of commercial intercourse, Italy ne uh, necessarily acquired those branches of knowledge and those arts and manufacturers which Greece had preserved from the civilization of ancient times. From the period of emancipation of the Italian cities by Otho the Great, they gave evidence of what history has testified alike in earlier and later times, namely that freedom and industry are inseparable companions. Even although not unfrequently, the one has become into existence before the other. If commerce and industry are flourishing anywhere, one may be certain that the freedom is nigh at hand. If anywhere freedom has unfolded her banner, it is certain that sooner or later industry will there establish herself for nothing is more natural than, uh, than that when man has acquired material or mental wealth, he should strive to obtain guarantees for the transmissions of his acquisitions to his successors. Or that when he has acquired freedom, he should devote all his energies to improve the physical and intellectual condition. 
For the first time since the downfall of the free states of antiquity was the spectacle again presented to the world by the cities of Italy and free and rich communities. Cities and territories uh, reciprocally <laughs> arose to, rose to a state of prosperity and received a powerful impulse in that direction from the Crusades. The transport of the Crusaders and their baggage and material of war not only benefited Italy's navigation, it also afforded... All, it afforded also inducements and opportunities for the conclusion of advantageous commercial relations with the East, for the introduction of new industries, inventions, and plants, and for the acquaintance with new enjoyments. On the other hand, the oppositions of feudal lordship were weakened and diminished in manifold ways, owing to the same cause, tending to the greater freedom of the cities and the cultivation of the soil. Next, after Venice and Genoa, Florence became especially conspicuous for her manufacturers and her monetary exchange business. Already in the 12th and 13th centuries, her silk and woolen manufacturers were very flourishing. The guilds of those trades who took part in the government and under their influence, a republic was constituted. The woolen manufacturer alone employed 200 manufacturers, man, uh, manu manufactories which produced annually eight to 80,000 pieces of cloth, the raw material for which was imported from Spain. In addition, these raw cloth to the amount of 300,000 gold, uh, golden was imported annually from Spain, France, Belgium, and Germany, <clears throat> which after being finished at Florence was exported to the Levant. Florence conducted the banking business of the whole of Italy and contained 80 banking establishments. The annual revenue of her government amounted to 300,000 gold gulden, 15 million francs of our present money. I'll, I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure. Considerably more than the revenues of the kingdoms of Naples and Aragon at that period, and more than that of Great Britain and Ireland under Queen Elizabeth V. We thus see Italy in the 12th and 13th century possessing all the elements of national economy, ec economical uh, prosperity, and in respect of both commerce and industry far in advance of all their nations. Her agriculture, and her manufacturers served as patterns as their motives for emulation to other countries. Her roads and canals were the best in Europe. The civilized world is indebted to her for banking institutions. The Mariner's Compass, improved naval, uh, improved naval architecture, the system of exchanges, and a host of the most useful commercial customs and commercial laws, as well as for the great parts of its municipal and governmental institutions. Her commercial marine and naval power were by far the most important to the Southern Seas. She was in possession of the trade of the world, for with the exception of the unimportant, uh, unimportant portion of it carried on over the northern seas. That trade was confined to the Mediterranean and to the Black Sea. She supplied all nations with manufactures and articles of luxury and with tropical products and was, by, and was supplied by them uh, with raw materials. One thing alone was wanting in Italy to enable her to become what England has become in our days. And because that one thing was wanting to her, every other element of prosperity passed away from her. She lacked national union and the power which springs from it. The cities and ruling powers of Italy did not act as members of one body, but made war and ravaged one another, like independent powers and states. While these wars raged externally, each commonwealth was successfully overthrown by the internal conflicts between democracy, aristocracy, and autocracy. These conflicts, so destructive to national prosperity, were uh, stimulated and increased by foreign powers and their invasions, and by the power of the priesthood at home and its pernicious influence, whereby separate Italian communities were arrayed against one another in two hostile factions. How Italy thus destroyed herself must may be best learned from the history of her maritime states. We first see Amalfi the Great and Powerful from the 8th to the 11th century. Her ships covered the seas, and all the coin which passed current in Italy and Levant was that of Amalfi. She possessed <clears throat> the most practical code of maritime laws, and those laws were enforced in every part of the Mediterranean. In the 12th century, her naval power was destroyed by Pisa. Pisa, in turn, fell under the attacks of Genoa, and Genoa herself, after a conflict of a hundred years, was compelled to succumb to Venice. The fall of Venice herself appears to have indirectly resulted from this narrow-minded policy. To a league of Italian naval powers, it could not have been a difficult task, not merely to maintain and uphold the uh, preponderance of Italian Greece, Asia Minor, and, Ar and the archipelago, and Egypt, but continually to extend and strengthen it, or to curb the progress of the Turks on land and repress their piracies at sea. While contesting with the Portuguese to patch us around the Cape of Good Hope, 
As matters actually stood, however, Venice was not merely left to her own resources. She found herself crippled by external attacks of her sister states and of the neighboring European powers. It could not have proved a difficult task to a well-organized League of Italian military powers to defend the independence of Italy against the aggression of the great monarchies. The attempt to form such a league was actually made in 1526, but then not until the moment of actual danger and only for a temporary defense. The lukewarmness and treachery of the leaders and members of this league were in the cause were the cause of the subsequent subjugation of Milan and the fall of the Tuscan Republic. From that period must be dated the downfall of the industry and commerce of Italy. In her earlier as well as later history, Venice aimed at being a nation for herself alone, so long as she had to deal with only one petty with uh, deal only with petty Italian powers or with decrepit Greece, she had no difficulty in maintaining a supremacy in manufactures and commerce through the countries bordering on the Mediterranean and Black Seas. As soon, however, as united and vigorous nations appeared in the political stage, <clears throat> it became manifest at once that Venice was merely a city, an aristocracy only a municipal one. It is true that she had conquered several islands and even extensive provinces, but she ruled over them only as a conquered territory. And hence, according to the testimony of all historians, each conquest increased her weakness instead of her power. At the same period, the spirit within the republic, which she had grown great, gra had grown great gradually, died away. The power and prosperity of Venice, the work of the patriotic and heroic aristocracy, which has sprung from an energetic and liberty-loving democracy, maintained itself and increased so long as the freedom, demo uh, the freedom of demo democratic energy lent its support, and then the energy was guided by the patriotism and the wisdom and heroic spirit of the aristocracy. But in proportion, as the aristocracy became a despotic oligarchy, destructed to the freedom of the freedom and energies of the people, the roots of power and prosperity died away, notwithstanding that their branches and leading, them, leading stem appeared to flo uh, still flourish for some time longer. A nation which has fallen into slavery, says Montague, strives rather to retain what it possesses than to acquire more. A free nation, on the contrary, strives to acquire rather than to retain. This is true to uh, this is very true observation, as he might have added, and because any one strives only to retain without acquiring, must come to grief. For every nation which comes, uh, which makes no forward progress, sinks lower and lower, and must ultimately fail. Far from striving to extend their commerce and make new discoveries, the Venetians never even conceived the idea of deriving benefit from discoveries made by other nations that they could be excluded from the trade with the East Indies by the discovery of the new commercial route uh, th thither <laughs> never occurred to them until they actually experienced it. What all the rest of the world perceived they would not believe, and when they began to find out the injurious results of the altered state of things, they strove to maintain the old commercial route instead of seeking to participate in the benefits of the new one. They endeavored to maintain by petty entries what could only be won by making wise use of the altered circumstances by, uh, by the spirit of enterprise and by the hardihood. And when they at, at length had lost what they had possessed and the wealth of the East and West, and these poured into Cadiz and Lisbon instead of their own ports, like simpletons or spendthrifts, they turned their uh, attention to alchemy. <laughs> in the times when the Republic grew and flourished, to be inscribed in the Golden Book was regarded as a, regard, uh, as a reward for distinguished ex uh, exertions in commerce in industry or in the civil military service of the state. On the condition this honor was open to foreigners, for example, to the most distinguished of the silk manufacturers who had emigrated from Florence, but that book was closed when man began to regard places of honor and state salaries as the family inheritance of the, pat of the patrician class. At a later period when men recognized the necessities of giving new life to the impoverished and enfeebled aristocracy, the book was reopened, but the chief title to the inscription in it was no longer as in former times who have rendered services to the state but to the possession of the wealth and noble birth. At length, the honor of being inscribed in a golden book was of so little esteem that it remained open for a century with scarcely any additional names. If we inquire to history what were the causes of the downfall of this republic and its commerce, she replies that they, principal, they principally consisted of, in the folly of neglect and cowardice of a worn-out aristocracy and apathy of the people who had sunk into slavery. The commerce and manufactures of Venice must have been declined, even if the new route, new route found around the Cape of Good Hope had never been discovered. 
the cause of it, as the fall of other Italian republics, is to be found in the absence of national unity, in the domination of foreign powers, in priestly rule at home, and in the rise of the greater, more powerful, more, uni uh, more united nationalities in Europe. If we carefully consider the commercial policy of Venice, we see that we see at a glance that of modern commercial and manufacturing nations is but a copy of that in Venice, and only on an enlarged, i.e. national scale, by navigation laws and custom duties, in each case native vessels and native manufacturers were protected against those of foreigners, and the maxim thus they held, thus early held good, that it was sound policy to import raw materials from other states and to export them manufacturers' goods. It had been recently asserted in defense of the principle of absolute and unconditional free trade that her protective policy was the cause of the downfall of Venice. That assertion comprises a little truth, and with great deal of error. If we investigate the history of Venice with an unprejudiced eye, we find that in her case, as in that of the great kingdoms of the later period, freedom of international trade as well as restrictions on it have been beneficial or prejudicial to the power and prosperity of the state at different epochs. Unrestricted freedom of trade was beneficial to the Republic in the first years of her existence, for how otherwise could she have raised herself from a mere fishing village to a commercial power? But a protective policy was so beneficial to her when she had arrived at a certain stage of power and wealth, for by means of it she attained the uh, manufacturing and commercial supremacy. Protection first became <clears throat> injurious to her when her manufacturing and commercial power had reached that supremacy because by it all competition with other nations became absolutely excluded, and thus indolence was encouraged. Therefore, not the introduction of a protection, a protective policy, but perseverance in manufacturing it after the vet reasons as for, as for its introduction had passed away was really injurious to Venice. Hence the arguments to which we have averted this great fault that it takes no account to the rise of great nations under hereditary monarchy. Venice, although mistress of some provinces and islands, yet being all the time merely one Italian city, stood in competition at the period of her rise to a manufacturing and commercial power, merely with other Italian cities and her prohibitory uh, pro <clears throat> commercial policy could benefit her so long only as whole nations with united power did not enter into competition with her. But as soon as that took place, she could only have maintained her supremacy by placing herself at the head of a united Italy and by embracing in her commercial system the whole Italian nation. No commercial policy was ever clever enough to maintain continuously the commercial supremacy of a single city or over united nations. From the example of Venice so far, it may be adduced against a protective commercial policy at the present time. Neither more nor less can be inferred than this. At a single city or a small state cannot establish or maintain such a policy successful, uh, successfully in competitions with great states and kingdoms. Also, that any power by means of a protective policy has attained a position of manufacturing and commercial supremacy after she has attained it, revert with advantage to the policy of the free trade. In the argument before averted to, as in every other, uh, when international freedom of trade is the subject of a discussion, we meet with a misconception which has been apparent of much error occasioned by the misuse of the term freedom. Freedom of trade is spoken of in the same terms as religious freedom and municipal freedom. Hence, the friends and advocates of freedom feel themselves especially bound to defend freedom in all its forms. And thus, the term free trade has become popular without drawing the necessary distinction between freedom of internal trade within the state and freedom of trade between separate nations, notwithstanding that these uh, two in their nature and operation are as distinct as the heaven in, is from the earth. For while restrictions on the internal trade of a state are compatible in only very few cases with the liberty of individual citizens, in the case of international trade, the highest degree of individual liberty may consist with a high degree of protective policy. Indeed, it is even possible that the greatest freedom of international trade may result in national servitude, as we hope thereafter, hereafter to show from the case of Poland in respect to the Montague says truly, commerce is never subjected to greater restrictions than in free nations and never subjected to less ones than in those under despotic governments. That's bananas. Let me read that again. Commerce is never subjected to greater restrictions than in free nations 
and never subjected the less ones than in those under despotic government. That's... Hmm. Y'all think about that. You know what I'm saying? Thank you for watching. It's Tom Pease of Pinoy News. You make sure you hit that subscribe button. You know what I'm saying? Hit that, hit that little notification bell. You know what I mean? You want to support the channel. Yo, T-shirts. There's a... Uh, yeah, there's a link for T-shirts. And a T Public store for Streamlabs, for the Patreon. You know what I'm saying? Help me out. You know how it works. Peace.